to walk alone for weeks and weeks at a time and to be hyper present and to sort of connect with community and people and photograph and write portraits and photograph portraits that is its own beautiful aesthetic experience a uh, a rare week off for the show last week as um, as I holidayed on an island just south of England land called the Isle of Wight. I think I picked up a... No, not I think. I know I picked up a slight cold as well. My voice doesn't feel quite as strong and as deep uh, and as impactful. Well, let's put it this way. I wouldn't be going for a voiceover audition with any <laughs> great hopes today. I'm walking along, though, my favourite footpath, mine and Barnes. Well, I speak for Barnes. Sir Barkalot footpath along the Kennet and Avon Canal just going through the slightly more uh, industrial part of the walk which is still interesting to photograph in fact let's make a let's make a picture now hold on Barnes let's get one of my sketchbooks to start the week this uh, magnificent blue building in front of me which I like to photograph because there's a great reflection in the uh, in the water usually it's a bit of a blur day today uh, right, here we go. F5.6, shutter speed 1 2 fifth, and uh, there we go. A sketchbook to start the, uh, the show today. Come on, Barnes, this way. Yeah, so the week off of uh, the show last week, holidaying in the, 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 the Isle of Wight, wonderful place. We've been going there, what, five, six years or so? Now I'm, I'm a bit confused because one of the years I don't think we went. No, we did go, but we didn't go with the family that we usually go with when we go across because it was uh, COVID. It was that time that sure not be mentioned. We go usually, though, to a particular farm, uh, which was also the venue of one of the uh, podcast photo retreats. It's not a large island, the, the Isle of Wight, and it does seem like a, a place away from the main few towns, that is. It does feel like a place that... You could honestly be stepping back several decades as soon as you as soon as you drive off the ferry. Fun fact about the Isle of Wight, it has Britain's oldest phone box. Now, phone boxes are almost as, um, well, practically extinct, really, as actual make-a-call type of phone boxes these days. You, you find them used for, I don't know, swapper book libraries or defib boxes, but uh, in Bembridge on the, the Isle of Wight, there is one of the, if not the oldest, oldest red boxes still being used for calling out from, with an actual hold it to your ear attached to a called phone. Um, though it doesn't do any business on account of the fact it doesn't accept the currency that we're currently using in the UK today. But if you happen to be I don't know, carrying a, a particularly smelly, grumpy goat and can fit its hoof in the slot. You'll have no problems whatsoever. So, uh, so last week, yes, on holiday with family, and I decided to take the actual week off. Not even post a best of. But you know me. <laughs> the draw to speak into a microphone is just too tempting. So I did make a show for Extra Milers, uh, number 60, which uh, has been out for a week or so now. A show about um, a new photographic hobby. Uh, that I've found, amongst other things. And if we weren't looking for goats to spend in the phone box, I, uh, I did something that, um, well, I've been meaning to do for a long, long time. And at last, in the evenings when everybody was catching their breath from catching smelly old goats, I started to write the newsletter. A newsletter, Neil. Did you travel back that far in time? Oh, no, hear me out. Newsletters, a.k.a. the far less romantic label these days of digital marketing, are still very much the currency, I think, for sharing ideas and thoughts and commentary and uh, great inspiring stuff that you, you wish to share. And whilst I think the letters that land in your inbox that just want to sell you, sell you stuff are probably more common these days, uh, there are those that are full of inspiration. They're still doing the rounds. And uh, I have the writer of, of one, well, of several actually, on the show today. Because I've been signed up to uh, an American living in Japan, Craig Mod's newsletters, for a while now, a fair while. And uh, I think it's been a, 
a good year in the making, trying to find time to suit us both for a chat. But today, today is that day. He's a writer, he's an essayist, he's a newsletterist, made up word, a wanderer with a notepad and camera across his adopted new home of, of Japan. I love his ideas and I love the way he approaches making portraits of the people along the trail that, uh, or the trails that he, uh, that he tracks. And I'm hoping today to pass that inspiration on to you. Today on The Photo Walk. Well, if I keep my cost of living uh, extremely low, as low as possible, then that just lets me go on these strange adventures. That hitchhiking trip, which took a month, was, I would say, the first real adventure I went on in my life. And um, it was incredible. It was heartbreaking. It was complicated. If you told that 20 year old version of myself what I was doing today he would he would be so excited the joy of approaching someone talking with them taking their portrait you know really feeling like you connected with them was so it was such a high the the more and more I kind of connected with this culture the more I realized how rich it was and how it was worth bearing witness to every day that you have is sort of it's like a bonus day and so really like all of the work that I'm doing is just about bearing witness about trying to understand what a richness of life feels like and looks like. That's Craig Mod sharing thoughts about life and walking and writing and photography. And before I give you a flavour of today's mailbag too, thank you to our extra milers and mpb.com who sponsor this show and keep it here week on week on week. mpb.com is a website where you can safely buy, sell and trade quality used photo and video gear online and you become part of the the circular economy if you're buying you get peace of mind because you get a six month guarantee which is really important i think if you're buying online on uh, on any kind of trading site when it comes to camera gear if you're trading or selling mpb will send a courier to pick up your kit on a day that you say i'm in And once it's arrived back at their warehouse and gone through the checks to make sure you graded it properly, uh, then you get paid direct into your account quickly. mpb.com, it's a a very easy to use website and it's helping photographers like me, I use them, to buy a quality use kit or sell gear that you no longer need to free up cash and give others a chance to make their stories. Go to mpb.com and I will have a link on today's show page. On the show today then, in the mailbag, photographing on the street. Do you need to be bold? And what is all the fuss about street work anyway? The illegally felled historic tree, yes, Sycamore Gap, and why the end is... Well, it's not really the end. Also, when is an ancient temple not an ancient temple? There's a lot of questions today, and the language of the show seems to be catching on which sounds a bit cryptic, all will be explained later on in the show. Plus, we end with a PS provided by the writer of the very first letter today, a kind of bookend, since uh, a lot of the show today is about books and writing. Oh, and there's a, a reason to look up and photograph the clouds above our heads. Plus, it being the first Friday of the month, it's assignment time. A challenge for a picture photographer Helen Jones Florio would like you to make over the next month. And like my conversation with Craig Mod, this is one challenge I've been meaning to record for, well, easily a year, perhaps more, definitely since we started setting assignments anyway. Uh, shall we walk then? Checklist out. Coffee, check. Garibaldi's, check. Walking boots, check. And an old smelly goat, should you happen across a phone box that no longer accepts current legal currency. Neil, I'll have to pass on the goat. All right, this time only. Let's walk. Yeah, the waters along here are not uh, raging as they were a couple of weeks back. We've had a lot of rainfall, certainly over the, over the weekend just gone. Really, we have. Must be time for a hosepipe ban. Right, let's dig into your, uh, your letters, shall we? This winter, I know we're officially late autumn, but uh, it, feel, it feels like winter's arrived. I shall be playing a little catch-up. I 
might have another one of those episodes where I just go through your letters in the mailbag. But uh, I realise there are a good few of you who have kindly sent in some incredible letters and wonderful pictures for us to show on the show page. So uh, first letter of the day shall be a kind of, well, it's a kind of two-parter, really. And it comes from Miles Barfield. Um, There are some writers who we hear from more regularly, and I feel we should probably have some sort of uh, some sort of term for you I, I, I certainly don't want to use the word regular as um, as a term for you because uh, well it makes you sound like a Swiss railways always on time train or a, or a word my mother oddly weaponized as a way to make me eat prunes for breakfast oh we got prunes for breakfast oh not prunes can't we have bacon sarnies, Mum? No, only at the weekend. It's a Thursday. Oh, what does that mean? Prunes Day. Oh, great. Can we have yoghurt with it? No, just the prunes alone. And then, and then she'd say something like it would make it all much, much better. Like, uh, it'll make you punctual. <laughs> Not quite sure that's the word she used, but you know what I mean. Like a, like a Swiss railways always on time train. And I can't believe we're starting this week like that. Apologies if you're eating your breakfast. I shall flagellate myself with a damp copy of the Photographic Times. Um, Here is one, he says, trying to rescue himself briskly from Miles Barfield then from America Land. Neil, many of your guests have expressed their love for photographing people. I've listened to several other podcasts. I've observed this to be a recurring theme. But for reasons I can't quite pinpoint i've never shared that passion it's not a matter of timidity i've been in law enforcement since 1995 which is well conditioned me to be assertive when necessary regardless i i decided to challenge my inclination for solitude when i make my photo walks and uh, ventured into street photography as an assignment sort of whilst wandering through seattle i noticed a uh, A man with music blaring, cycling with a technique that to me seemed far from perfect. Yes, he has a great big sort of huge speaker on his back, doesn't he? Yet his palpable joy while he was cycling was infectious. I waited for him to pass, wanting to capture him in his element without prompting a pose, and I took my shot. In retrospect... Street photography hasn't quite won my heart. I'm inclined to return to capturing nature and landscapes and moments of solitude, moments of nature. Much like this m- moment of nature you're, you're about to hear. We're walking across one of the many weirs. Now that does look spectacular. There's a lot of water movement here. Maybe I was wrong about the water. Sun's come out just at the right moment, but Barney is walking across very, very close to the edge, so I'm not quite sure I want to stop and make a picture of the the dancing water in the weir here. Let's move on safely. Return to to Miles's letter, shall we? Yeah, so I'm, I'm inclined to return, he says, to capturing nature and landscapes and moments of solitude. However, it was refreshing to, to step out of my comfort zone and experiment with something new. And isn't that what, what photography and photo walks, isn't that what it's all about, eh? trying something new you don't have to stick to the script do something different go on then pup ups here we go or pups up is what i meant to say he's found one of our excuse me miles while we stop for a second sir barkalot has found a bench what does it say on the bench in loving memory of a beloved husband and brother and dad and granddad norman john unwin uh tight lines oh he must have been a that's a fisherman's uh, phrase, isn't it? Tight line. Anglers, not fisherman, angler. Angler's phrase, tight lines. There used to be a programme a colleague of mine presented on a, uh, on a television station called Sky, Sky Sports. And uh, it was called Tight Lines. There we go, pups. I've got... Uh, <laughs> no, I had... It's a very amusing letter. I must dig it out, actually. Uh, I, had a, I had a letter in about Barnes's treats that I give him when he jumps up onto the bench here. And... Um, because he yeah, well it was ASMR wasn't it really with a dog oh hang on there's a cyclist coming let's go to one side Thank you. no worries have fun yeah we uh, we had well it wasn't really a letter of complaint but it was certainly a, a letter of somebody feeling a bit squeamish about uh, 
Barney and the way that he eats. The loudness, perhaps. Yes, Barnes, I'm talking about you. So, yeah. So, yes, it was refreshing uh, to step out of my comfort zone and experiment with something new. We're there. Keep walking from Miles Barfield. Um, I have to say, the, the bicycle picture that I shall put on the show page today is fabulous, Miles. It really is. And I know what you mean. Um, an unusual cyclist, if ever there were one. Uh, I can see how he caught your interest. How does all that ivy, this will whet your appetite or pique your interest to go to the show page today. We always have a show page. Go to photowalk.show and you'll find the corresponding episode show page. And uh, yeah, I can see how he piqued your interest. What's all that ivy that he's got wrapped around his bike? What's to stop that going into, into the spokes and there being an accident? I mean, how does it not get caught in the spokes? And look at what he's wearing, and look at that that huge speaker that he's wearing on his back. It's a bit, I mean, there's a juxtaposition with him and uh, and his cycling as well, I know. So anyway, that's on the show pace today. Thank you for that. The bike was really interesting. You mentioned the word timidity. And I think that's interesting, because I think many uh, people, many photographers, many who've tried and those yet to try, think of having to be in some way uh, emboldened. And, well, I've fallen into that, that trap myself, really. And I still do to an extent. I went on Gabriella Matola's brilliant street course. It's, it's where I think there was about eight of us and we, we met up. We all discussed making street portraits. And I suppose I went with some form of, um, uh, of hope, perhaps, that I might find some kind of silver bullet that, that made it really easy for me to approach strangers and ask to make a portrait of them. And, and it wasn't really that sort of thing at all, but it didn't matter. What it was was so much better than that. It was almost like a vindication that you could do it, that you can do it, that there is no silver bullet, um, that there's no trickery, there's no behind-the-scenes trickery. It's, uh, no, it was, that was fantastic, and I heartily recommend those in the UK and anywhere near London who can make that course to go on, on that particular street workshop. And actually, I, I have a, a film which I'll put on the show page today. Note to self, put this on the show page, Neil, when you, when you listen to this back through in the edit, uh, of legendary photographer Don McCullin, who's celebrated for his street work of the 60s in the uh, East End. I don't know why I've gone into that, of London. Uh, when the, the East End, <laughs> just have to do it with some sort of... Uh, affliction uh, was well let's just say it was very different to the 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 starbucks infested streets they are now and also of course his conflicts work Um, i say of course but i've spoken to a couple of photographers of late and this shows you know when a new generation of photographers comes around that um that the greats that i often refer to and i'm sure you refer to as well aren't necessarily universally known by those coming into the industry i feel it's a responsibility um on my part to do that but uh, yeah Don Don's amazing incredibly potent and uh, sad disturbing um, uh, conflict work this film that I shall put on the show page today that was made I think it was made for Canon pretty sure it was uh, or made by Canon he is very easy when it comes to making portraits on the streets of India where this particular film was made Um, he doesn't speak the local language But that's not an issue. There's no brashness to him. Um, There's no requirement for him to be in any way bolder than you or I would um, otherwise be. He just has this approach of somebody so genuinely interested and and fascinated and curious about what lays before his feet. And before you say, oh, yeah, but he's in India. I mean, yes, you can be that way when you're in India as a documentarian on the street. But no, I don't think... That's necessarily the point of... uh, I mean, I think he could do the same thing if if he were walking around. (laughs) The city of Leeds comes to mind, or a local village close to where you and I live. I think he would he would be the same way. It's the curiosity, isn't it? It's not in, it, it being emboldened. It's, a, it's the curiosity. But thank you, Miles. I think I've gone off on one. <laughs> uh, your pictures will be on the show page as well as a link to your Instagram. And uh, I did say pictures because so far I've only talked about one picture uh, because there's a PS photograph 
right at the end of today's show, which floated my photographic boat in every single way possible. And if that's not a tease to remain to, to the very, very end of today's programme, I can't think of what would be. I love this part of the river in particular. I've just snaked around the, the canal. It does a sort of S shape here. And then I find myself away from the industrial part, which I, I still enjoy. It's not just not so good for recording the podcast along that sort. So, uh, so yeah, this is, the, this is the first signs of, or the first sounds of, of peace. Let me get a picture. Just as the river, oh, there's an angry foreboding cloud in the background. That one says, I'm going to rain on you. Well, I am. Uh, let's get a picture. There's a big beech tree there, I think. As, the, uh, as it just starts to snake around. 480 shutter speed. The sun's come out, blessing me for a second. 5.6. There we go. One of my, uh, one of my sketchbooks, which apparently I can be quite derogatory about. I put them down. And I say that because I appeared on a podcast this week. Well, I say I appeared. I, I, um, I, I made the recording with, uh, with, a, with Kim Cofield, who, who gets mentioned uh, a few times on this program, one of our very precious um, extra milers as well. She has an art podcast, which, of course, when this all goes live, I shall link to heartily but we did talk about sketchbooking at quite some length and i explained my feelings about making sketchbook images with your cameras you just go about your life and make your walks right if you'd like to send something in just like miles did a moment ago a story of where you walk a story about your photography about you um, and then send some pictures as well you don't have to send pictures it's fab fabulous when you do but um for those that walk and don't necessarily wish to share their photographic journey then it's lovely to hear from you as well just uh, just by your letters then send them your letters that is your emails to stories at photowalk.show stories at photowalk.show if you're sending pictures two and a half thousand pixels wide please if you can optimize the pictures don't go in there pups that's a deep part of the canal this is not a day i feel like jumping in <laughs> it's too cold um, but if you can't uh, resize your images because you don't necessarily have the, the wherewithal, the software to do it, then don't worry. Here comes the famous phrase, stand by. Remember this phrase. It's important for something that's coming up later. I will do the heavy lifting and I'll uh, optimize them for you. Right, a couple of letters with pictures on the show page. Then I shall introduce today's special studio guest. Short and sweet. Wish you were here. Post I love the postcards you're sending in. This one from Judy Cleese. The postcards you're sending in, by the way, are the postcards that you make. Just in case you're a first time here and thinking, what, postcards? I've got to send postcards. No, these are the pictures you make of the places you walk or the places you live or the things you see. Sometimes the strange things that you see. Um, this is from Judy. Neil, I'm not sure if this is the right address. It is and it was stories at photowalk.show but I thought you might like this I was shooting a sunset next to the waters ah oh, lakes and rivers hey eh? you've got the same idea as me Judy they they have something about them don't they uh, and this boat just happened to float by gently at the right time and I think it made the whole photograph very relaxing well you're not wrong at all it 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 is and it does and it did <laughs> um in, and it adds a, there's a further sort of focal point to the picture, isn't there? I mean, the lake itself, a lake or a river, a pond or whatever can be, uh, the sea can be fabulous images. But put something before you in that image as well and you introduce, well, you introduce scale. That's one thing that you do introduce and that can be wonderful. And you introduce another focal element to the picture, another, another point of interest to the picture. So, uh, yeah, I love it. Thank you very much. And I'll show this with uh, great pleasure on the show page today. Um, boats are tranquil, <laughs> unless, because I appreciate not everybody likes boats, unless you're like my mother-in-law on, um, 
on Lake Windermere in the uh, in the Lake District of England land with, uh, well, how old would Thomas have been at the time? This is a couple of years ago. He'd have been, he'd have been 11 as a pinstriped express just passes us by. Yeah, he'd have been 11 and he was driving this electric pleasure boat for, uh, well, it would have been the mother-in-law, father-in-law, myself, Thomas, Jack and, and my wife, Sam. And uh, he knew that the slightest movement or ripple, my mother-in-law is, oh, she's ready to call the Coast Guard. And he knew it. He was very conscious of this and he was weaving, weaving side to side, um, trying to catch even the slightest wake <laughs> of a passing canoe. But, uh, yeah, happy, happy memories. Love the picture, Judy. I do. It's on the show page. And uh, the second one, the second letter is from Craig Wilson with a few pictures, actually, to share. And uh, we'll start with a story we haven't talked a lot of. And, uh, and you know why? I was, I was kind of afraid that uh, if everybody talked too much about this, however, it became a huge story. So why I should make such a difference, I flatter myself. But there was, there was part of me that thought, if everybody talks too much about this story... The Egypts, as the Irish would say, that do exist in the world, sadly, and a few can make quite the impression sometimes. I was afraid of, um, I, w- I was afraid that the Egypts might start copycatting. And this, this letter sort of, um, well, let, let me read it. Hi, Neil. I'm sure you're aware of the sad news of somebody's reckless behaviour cutting down the beloved tree at Sycamore Gap on Hadrian's Wall. That tree... And many of you as photographers will have so many stories about this tree. Um, That tree was my first photo walk along Hadrian's Wall right back in 2018. And now there's thousands of photographs of the tree um, and it makes me realise how important our photos are historically now that that tree is no longer. You're absolutely right. Every single one of those thousands of pictures that's, uh, that's been made and taken of this, this tree, uh, they're part of its history. It was there. And that's really very important. I've included some photos. One of the tree at Hadrian's Wall with my first camera, a Canon 1000D. And, uh, and also a local tree, which equally sadly is no longer there. And a recent photo trip to um, Street, uh, is it Streetly? No, Steetly, Steetly Pier. As the rumours are that the wooden pier there is about to be cut down as well. Fingers crossed, says Craig. It's just a rumour. Thanks for the show, Neil. It's a constant inspiration to use my camera uh, from Craig in Sunderlands. I looked up the pier. It is Steetly, isn't it? Not Streetly. Streetly is a village near me. That's why I wanted to call it that. It's Steetly, Steetly Pier. Um, It's at Crimden Beach in the, uh, well, near Sunderland. This impressive 2,000 feet, that's long, pier was originally built to provide fresh water to the former Steetly Magnesite plant in the 1960s. I've, uh, anyway, look, I'll pop the the pictures on the the show page today, along with, uh, come on, pups, this way along with a link um, to see more of your, of your work. I'm still aghast, I really am. This way, pups. There we go, a lock. Are we going under the bridge? Hoo-hoo. Embracing my inner three-year-old. Come on, pups, this way. Um, yeah, the, um, I'm still aghast. I don't understand why anybody wanted to chop that beautiful, historic tree. Yes, it's appeared in many, many films. Um, including Robin Hood. Yes, I know that. Morgan Freeman and Kevin Costner lent against it, I think. But um, uh, atop that, another pinstriped express. Let's wave them away. Enjoy. But atop that, the history of this tree, what it's seen across the hundreds and hundreds of years for somebody just to come along on a whim and say... I'm having that. I'm going to chop that down. I still don't understand somebody's um, somebody's psyche. Somebody's uh, oh, I, d- I just don't get it. I think we know that, Neil. I I can tell. But I po- but I popped it on the show page along with a link to your uh, your Instagram. Actually, there's some fabulous work on the. Uh, let's move along here. There's a swan here. I know. Look, hissing him. Don't hiss. Stop hissing. You don't need to hiss. Standing in the middle of the countryside, 
remonstrating with a swan. Um, yeah, your pictures on the Instagram. Oh, what journeys, what photographic, photo-walking journeys you have. The, um, your picture of Dru Druid's Temple in Yorkshire, just amazing. I've never seen that place before. I didn't know it existed. It's incredible. Um, if you don't know the story, just to fill in the gaps a bit here, about the tree at Hadrian's Wall, and probably because you don't live in the UK, because I think if you lived in the UK, or you live in the UK, that story would have been impossible to, uh, to miss. This, this, the story of the, the tree, how it was removed, or chopped down rather to start with, how it was chopped down, I will leave a link to that on the show page today because it beggars belief, it really does. Now, they've just, uh, I think in the, really the last week or days have finally removed the, uh, the tree and, um, and that story I shall link to on the show page as well. I read these words from The Guardian on the uh, on the day the tree was taken away which uh, a link of which i'll leave on the show page but let me read just the first couple of paragraphs because i think there's something very pertinent said some saw the day the piece writes as a chance to say farewell to the tree one person described the event as a full stop really to the saga but as the criminally felled, world-famous sycamore tree was carefully removed from its home on Hadrian's Wall, people also spoke of hope and optimism and rebirth. The irony, in quotes now, of this criminal act is that we've reset the clock on this tree now, says Andrew Pode, the National Trust's general manager of the site. In forestry terms, it's been coppiced and it will regrow. And that, I believe, is the, uh, the positive thing to, to come from this. Positive in inverted commas, perhaps. Right. Thank you for your, your letters into the show. Thank you. Oh, it's just started raining. I think we're going to try and find our, our way to woodland, pups. Come on. Let's wait this one out. I don't know what my app says. I shall check it out to see... Uh, I tell you what, we'll take cover. I shall check out the app to see how long the rain's going to be with us. I'll make a couple of pictures too, and we can listen to part one of Craig Mod, can't we? Look at that. That could be <laughs> every cloud, so to speak, quite literally in this case. That can be uh, that can be the silver lining, can't it? We'll we'll sit this one. We'll sit the rain out for a while and listen to Craig Mod. Now, he is an author, a prolific writer about the adventures that he makes uh, with his walking shoes and boots. And a, and a camera. He's a, he's a photographer who makes these long walks across Japan, the country that he's made home for nearly two decades now. He's also a man who describes pizza toast as his spiritual food. <laughs> and why not, I say? I've, um, I've actually made my own pizza toast, that is, following a film of his, which I'll share on the show page today. But, uh, but also, there's a reason I've decided to release the Photo Walk's own newsletter this week, and it's this man you're about to hear. There's a... Uh, oh, can you hear the rain now? <laughs> and there's uh, a reason I will be releasing very soon the show's first book. And in part, that's also down to this man. Although, um, a fair amount of credit also needs to be accepted by our friend Valerie Jardin, who earlier this week actually recorded um, a special with me about publishing and self-publishing that's to wear soon maybe even next week not quite sure yet still in the edit so uh, this interview this interview to me today it feels like um, it feels like a circle which is at last completing its shape and I hope very much that it's uh, going to be the first of several conversations because I feel we have more to to return to in this um, in this first part, part one of two today, actually there's, uh, I think, a hearty nod to the practicals of publishing and building an audience, something that we don't talk too often about. And uh, in the second part, we discuss in more depth about his walks and his books and some intriguing rules that he gives himself when he's making his walks. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this week's studio guest. While we shelter from the rain, are you ready, pups? Should we go find some shelter? Here's this week's studio guest, Craig Mod. Craig, I read in one of your, your newsletters, and uh, we'll come to newsletters properly in a while, I live in a somewhat uncommon, sometimes extremely wacky life. 
Well, was it an expected destination, this somewhat uncommon, extremely wacky life? I mean, yes and no. In, just in that, I don't think I've ever had much of a common, you know, I've never, I've never been drawn to an office. When I was 19, I was lucky enough to have a couple of internships out in California. I remember doing one one summer, and it was for this you know big-ish tech company. This is back in the late '90s. E- they were called EFI, Electronics for Imaging, and I got paid really well. And you know, I kind of worked on some converting some of their software to web projects back when that was like a thing that could happen. And I remember them at the end of the summer being like, "Hey, we'd love for you to just work here full time. We'll pay for college. Like, just come on out." You can da-da. and I was just it, zero pull in that direction. Yeah. Absolutely not. I remember going for a walk with a friend in San Francisco and just being like, I, am I, is there something wrong with me? Is there something broken? Like, I just don't, I don't feel any attraction to whatever that is to going into those in office space, for example. And so I've always kind of worked really hard and you could see a lot of the structure of my life and like choosing to live in Tokyo and um, living in the way that I've lived just pretty austerely, you know, pretty aesthetically. It's all been in service to, to being able to work on projects yeah. and to do wacky explorations without kind of compromise. But really since like 18, 19, 20, as soon as I was out in the real world, I mean, this has been the MO. I share with you that that concept of, am I doing something wrong? Have I not quite read the scripts correctly? Because, yeah. I mean, and particularly, I suppose, with a magnifying glass of COVID held over it, my life, I suppose at times, I would have looked at others' lives and thought, well, it must be easy to just picking up a check at this point in life. But it's never been as much fun. Yeah, and I think that's really what the crux of it was. I mean, I never had any any money to speak of. I mean, my family was not wealthy. You know, I come from a, a really working class town, blue collar town. Everyone worked at the, at the airplane engine factory. None of my friends I grew up with had anything close to what you'd describe as wealth. And so I wasn't coming from this like t- trust fund, fund place, but it was more this, uh, well, if I keep my cost of living uh, extremely low, as low as possible, then that just lets me go on these strange adventures, you know, and kind of pursue these artistic impulses, which were connected with photography and programming and writing. Um, and that's always been the case since, honestly, like since 10, 11, 12 years old. Those have, that, those have been the interests. In and I've, I've just kind of worked hard to create a life where I can kind of pursue those without compromise. I would imagine that many people, and I suppose I did myself, maybe I fell into the trap myself when I first read your material. And I thought, oh, th- this must be somebody who's obviously, he's done well, he's done okay, he's invested wisely. Um, this is how he can afford to go on these amazing adventures. And it's really interesting to hear somebody says, no, 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 that, that's not the way. That couldn't be further from the truth. My, li- my life is very different to that, which yours is. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, well, first of all, the adventures I'm going on are, are don't cost a lot of money. <laughs> well, they're, they're, yeah, it's walking, 40- isn't it? I mean, if you've got a good pair of boots, you're away. That's it. So like that, you know, 43-day walk I did five years ago from... Kamakura up to Tokyo, Tokyo to Kyoto, and then down the peninsula, the key peninsula. I mean, that walk it cost me in total. I mean, that was, you know, maybe $3,000, something like that. I mean, it, it's just like the equipment is certainly more expensive than the actual adventures themselves. And, and once you have the equipment, you can kind of just keep going, you know, almost ad nauseum, you know, for free in a way. Well, let's talk about your adventures. In fact, it, I, I was wondering how to um, how to get a timeline on this. R- let's start with Ridgeline and Roden. They're, they they are the newsletters of your life. Uh, tell me about those first of all, because they they cover very different facets of, of of your life. One being more tech than the the Zen of walking and discovery. Yeah. So Roden was my original newsletter, and I started that about twelve or thirteen years ago when I was working in California. I went out and I, w- I worked in California for a couple of years. Again, just kind of like to prove to myself that I could work with people operating at that at that scale at that level, you know, in in uh, with that kind of talent. Because here in in Japan. As talented as obviously many people are in Japan, there is a kind of insular issue here where Japan is not a global facing country at all. And so even if you go work for a big tech company or like a a startup here in in Tokyo, you do not get the same experience you get, say, going to Palo Alto and working for, you know, a startup in in that context. So I really want to experience that. So I went and I did that. And in the middle of that, I mean, I was doing a lot of writing about the future of books, the future of publishing, digital, digital publishing, digital reading. And Rodin kind of came out of a lot of my I got a lot of attention around my essays and I wanted a way to capture that attention that wasn't just Twitter or Facebook followers or something like that so I started the newsletter Roden and it's kind of Roden has really just been my kind of playful exploratory place where I write about 
film and art and literature and photography. Yeah. And um, it's monthly. Uh, five years ago when I started the membership program, my special projects membership program, I kind of used that as a forcing function to make Roden monthly explicitly. And then I also launched Ridgeline, which is the was the the walking related uh, weekly newsletter. It's sort of dropped off a little bit from weekly, but it still is focused pretty explicitly just on walking and walking in Japan. You are an explorer with a notepad and a camera. What was your your creative driving force? The the picture element, the photography, or the or the writing. I mean, I always had an interest in photography, but again, it was one of these things where like we didn't have the money to buy a camera when I was younger. So there were no cameras in my house and no one around me had a camera. There's no, I I had no exposure to real photography until I came to Japan when I was 19. And I finally saved up enough to to buy a used Nikon at one of the shops in Ginza. And, you know, the uh, 50... 1.8, 1.8, you know, which was like, yeah. you, could, you could get for $45 or something like that back then. That was my first foray into into real, quote unquote, real, real photography. And I spent that first year here in Japan just obsessing over it and reading photo.net and trying to teach myself as much as I could about just film stocks and light and, you know, uh, exposure compensation and everything. And I, I was really taken by it. And during that first year when I was in Japan, I was 19 years old and I hitchhiked across the country and I kind of photographed my way through that adventure not as rigorously as i wish i had because i think there could have been a lot more it could have been a lot a lot, a lot more beautiful uh, images taken during that trip yeah. um and i was for some reason in that moment obsessed with slide film so it was all it was all shot on fuji velvia 50 oh, iso 50 beautiful. So beautiful. Like, yeah but beautiful I, I just introduced my youngest to it only a couple of years ago yeah. he, it was like a magic thing that he found in the cupboard what are yeah. these yeah 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 so i've got a big box of fuji velvia stuff Perfect. in that but when i I, th- I would say during that year I'm 19, I'm 20 years old, I'm reading a lot of Murakami Haruki, I'm kind of being entranced by the, the, the loner, the solo loner, I mean, I always felt drawn to that, I'm adopted, so I think with adoption always comes this sense of outsiderness and a little bit of a disconnection from family mm-hmm. and from your tribe, you don't really have a tribe, so I think when I was 19, 20, the Murakami stuff really hit, his characters are so independent yeah. and isolated. And yet they kind of live these kind of rich, full, adventurous lives. So that that hitchhiking trip, which took a month, was, I would say, the first real adventure I went on in my life. And um, it was incredible. It was heartbreaking. It was complicated. It was a little bit dangerous. But I would say that if you told that 20 year old version of myself what i was doing today he would he would be so excited yeah. that's what he what i'm doing today is what he wanted to do but didn't know existed in the world or, or exists as an option and so it feels like to be able to draw a line between what i'm doing now and who i was then i've kind of fulfilled i, I feel like i've fulfilled a lot of the spiritual and and artistic goals that i i had but didn't know how to articulate back when i was 20. in terms of moving to japan how did that move move happen it's not just around the block after all i was really disillusioned with university in america right. and um and like i said i i came from a tough town where a lot most kids didn't go to college and um you know there really wasn't a blueprint to follow uh, to go to college to go to grad school to to get a phd anything like that that was totally inconceivable and i was about to drop out of school and and go to california i just wanted to work during the first tech boom i was just excited about actually building software related to writing so writing writing uh writing software blogging software before blogging was a thing and i met a couple of japanese exchange students at the time and i was we started talking and it was kind of fun interacting with them and chatting about life in japan and uh, i said well what are the three best universities in japan and they gave them to me i wrote them down i went online and one of them had a really good english website so i was like all right great i'll apply that's the one (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they, had an, they had an international program and I got in and the cost of it was so low. This is like a, this is a big part of, again, these hacks is that the cost of a year of studying abroad with a homestay was a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what, you know, university costs in America. So I was just like, this is a no brainer. Obviously I go do this and uh, kind of have this adventure, have this experience. And, and I was really a really intense studier. Like, I mean, it was a rigorous academic year. Yeah. It wasn't just coming over here and goofing off. I mean, I learned a ton. I learned so much about Japanese theology, politics, language, linguistics. 
um, obviously history, Chinese influence on, on the written language, on art, on everything. So it was an incredible year, absolutely incredible and, and totally worth whatever paltry sum it was. And I got a scholarship. So it was, I mean, it was basically a free year in Japan. So why not do it? Yeah, but there was no going back after that by the sound of it. I can't imagine you will go but, back either. No. Yeah. I mean, I've, I'm, I, describe myself as an uh you know an immigrant here you know i immigrated from the u.s and i did so looking back now i can kind of piece together the reasons why it was so final um you know i went back like i said in 2010 2011 to california for a little bit but that was always temporary but um no i mean coming to japan i think what to me felt so healthy about it was I was bearing witness to a functioning society in a way that I think maybe people in Scandinavia have experienced. Uh, England, to a certain degree, maybe recently it's gotten a little more complicated, but, um, you know, having national health care, having good infrastructure, having uh, accessible social programs, stuff like that. And I think when I came to Tokyo, I didn't, I wasn't cogn- sort of consciously aware of any of these things, but I felt it in, in the way that people around me were able to live and the way we moved and the cost of living. And everything was so reasonable. Like Tokyo was very reasonably priced. I was eating amazing lunches for five, six dollars, you know, a lunch and access to these incredible, you know, museums and uh, exhibitions. I had healthcare. I didn't have to work for a company to get decent healthcare. I mean, it was just all these things that I think subconsciously, made me feel really good and felt yeah, yeah. more valued as a human in a way that I didn't feel in the place I came from. The the newsletters, the the books, the photography. Well, let's start with the uh, the, the newsletters, which we've mentioned. You, you um, the, the walking, um, have they become incredibly popular? Why, why, you mentioned blogs and you mentioned newsletters in the same sentence. And I wondered if there was a direction you took with newsletters where you thought, ah, hang on a moment. Blogs don't do what a newsletter can. Yeah, I mean, with the newsletters, it's... It was just, you know, you had RSS for blogs, which allowed people to kind of subscribe to your blog, but it was a little bit too complicated. I mean, what's beautiful about newsletters is it's email. Everyone has email. Yeah. Everyone knows how email works. Yeah. So there's just something really beautiful and simple about that. And you can always, you know, the way I do it is all my newsletters exist in tandem online. So it's essentially a blog that just gets distributed first over email. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. And that's the gateway, isn't it, to, to, to what has become um, a more private area for members to, to support what you do? Yeah, I mean, so the way I describe it is all of the newsletter work that I do, everything, everything, everything is pointing towards books. Yeah. That is my ultimate sort of goal for all of this work. If I go on a big walk, if I go on a jazz cafe tour, if I'm writing these newsletters, it's all about working out first drafts or drafts of ideas around things that could be books or will be books. Yeah. And um, five years ago, I was I was in kind of a rut and I was trying to sell essays to The Atlantic and other magazines and Which I was having success- trouble with that. You've successfully done though, haven't you? Or when you say trouble? I have, yeah, I, I have. But, I, I, you know, I, was, I wanted to go bigger and yeah. I kind of didn't know how to to go in the in a bigger direction and again i didn't really have any mentors i didn't really have any archetypes that like i go hey you know w- what am i missing here i want to write for the atlantic i've got five thousand words here this editor i'm trying to work with is being really complicated mm. like what what do i need to do so i thought about going to new york going to washington dc and just going in-house at a magazine and i actually went out i talked to editors and chiefs i spoke with a bunch of writers at these magazines and f- for the most part they were just like Craig, like, look, like, you know what you want to write about and you have an audience. And if you can do something with that on your own, that's, that's what everyone inside the magazine wishes they had, you know? So in a lot of ways, the Substack stuff and folks like Casey Newton breaking off from their bigger publications. Yeah. I mean, I was right on, on the forefront of that when I, when I five, this is, this would have been pretty much exactly five years ago now. And Substack, I think had come out and they were aggressively courting me to, to join. Um, but you know, Patreon existed. Kickstarter was in a way, kind of a, a, a first step towards memberships. And um, I had just written for Wired about membership programs. And I thought, okay, all right, let me give this a try. Let me, let, me, let me try doing a membership program. And if it works and that this somehow catalyzes or enables me to do the writing I've always wanted to do, but have been running into roadblocks going through traditional media venues, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then great, let's give it a try. And so I did. I launched you know, four, four years, uh, 10 months ago. And it was really depressing. It was a really depressing launch. I didn't get as many people as I hoped I, I could get. I know you said you almost um, screwed it up I, right from the start. Yeah, there's I like Ridgeline was way more popular than I expected it to be. Yeah, and I could have tied 
the launching of Ridgeline in with the membership program and then it could have unlocked it. Like Tim Carmody actually did a really beautiful uh, membership program launch like two weeks after I did. And I was like, Tim, like you should have done it two weeks earlier. I would have copied you. He did it really, he just, he did a really good job with it. Yeah. So, hey, it was, it was quite depressing. But what I found was that once I got over the, de- the depression and, and the kind of the, sh- the sticker shock of, of how little income you generate when you're starting off doing a membership program, I was able to really take that those memberships and, and those monthly and yearly fees yeah. and transmute them into a kind of purpose in a way that uh, on my own, I found really difficult to do. So, you know, that first 43 day walk five years ago was completely catalyzed by memberships and kind of looking at that and going, okay, these people want me to do something interesting, go on an adventure. Let me do that. Let me use this as, as, as the internal catalyst, instead of the Atlantic sending me on a, on a 40 day walk, I'm going to send myself it's through so my cool. membership program. And it worked. And I think it's a really uh, in, interesting thing on Patreon. We, we use Patreon for, for our, what we call extra mile. There's many different ways of doing it and there is advantages and disadvantages to the, the many ways of doing it. But I think the wonderful thing is that people appreciate now with art is that it may be free to uh, consume, but it's not necessarily free to make. It's a, an expression. I, I was, it's not mine. Somebody told me that in an interview. And I think, I think that idea of, of supporting art, but not doing it through the, through galleries or, 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 or doing it through large corporations. So I think that that's, that's a heartening thing, isn't it? I mean, I know I do it for people. I think that's very heartening. For sure. I mean, I think my story this year has kind of taken an, an interesting turn in that, you know, my next book I sold to Random House. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. So I, it's, it's, you know, which is this interesting kind of sequence, right? Because I was, I was sort of trying to operate within traditional media and I was, I found I, I had a difficulty getting in or doing what I wanted to do there. And so I went into completely independent. And then the membership was essentially this patronage model to enable me to go on these big walks, to go do these kind of audacious, exploratory, you know, uh, sort of adventures, and then converting those into books. And then the process of that of this over the last couple of years, because I've built up such an audience and I've sold so many books, um, suddenly, you know, big publishers begin to take note of that. Yeah. And so I think it is sort of being able to kind of lean on both of these worlds, I think is valuable yeah. and not be overly dependent on one or the other. So with the Random House deal, it was like, look, guys, I'm going to make this book. I would love to reach a bigger audience. I'd love to work with you, you know, Molly Turpin, the editor I'm working with. I really love yeah. how Molly thinks about books and, uh, the, you know, the books that she's produced. And so you know, being able to work with, with her is a great honor and it'll make, I'm, I'm sure it'll make my work better. Um, and so it's like, great. I would love to do that with you guys, but at the same time, I'm going to produce a fine art edition on my own. Look, I have these relationships with printers, look, with processes. I have a, you know, distribution center set up. I have everything set up to do this. And, um, when you look at the numbers, it's hard for me unless you're going to give me a crazy advance, like a really crazy advance. It's hard for me to, to, to not do my edition. Also, I just don't think anyone in the world is going to do a better job than I'll do in, in the quality of production, the quality of photographic reproduction, you know, the, the binding, ever, you know, the whole yeah. kit and caboodle. Well, let, let's talk about the, the creative side of it now. Um, I, I like this idea that you, you drive your adventures, your life, your walks, your photography um, around the idea that everything really has a book at the end of it. Because we talk about the tactile yeah. nature of books a lot on this program. And the tactile nature of a print it's what we talk about as photographers you know it's it's if it's locked away in a cupboard of zeros and ones on a disc it's um well it's nice but it's, it's you know it's it's not really doing what you what you created it for in many respects how many books have you uh, you made i mean it's 20, 20 years of making books or so isn't it give or take I mean, I've, I, I worked as an art director for an indie publisher for five or six years yeah. um, in my early 20s. And, and we, we ended up producing maybe six or seven books together. And that was, you know, they were all quite finicky. You, you know, the design and, and production were quite complicated for all of them. So it was, you know, we were, ta- we were drawing inspiration from McSweeney's. I don't know if you, if you remember McSweeney's no, in the no, early no. 2000s was doing. No. They were doing, McSweeney's was just producing, you know, indie publisher based out of San Francisco. Okay. Dave Eggers, uh, who's New York Times bestselling author, has a bunch of um, movies made from his books. Um, he was running this publishing house. 
And they were just doing really creative, quirky stuff, and we loved it. And so we were kind of copying their their style, like literally using the same printer in Iceland they used. Um, and so having a lot of fun with that. And then around 2007, 2008, I did my first book kind of on my own that I would I kind of feel comfortable putting my mm. name on. It was Art Space Tokyo. I worked with Ashley Rollins, who is now director of Blum and Poe, the the gallery, and um, and we put together this kind of. Uh, sort of, you know, anthropological study of the Tokyo art world in in that moment, 2008 ish, 2009, and um, that did really well. That sold out, and then I bought the rights back from my publisher, and we kickstarted that, and so it was one of the first kickstarted books that did really well. Um, and then I produced a bunch of one-off books, so I, I was doing, uh, yeah, just using blurb to do strange. Uh, single edition books. These, you know, these were essentially book experiments. Yeah. And then in 2016, I did Koya Bound with Dan Rubin, and that was, you know, but I started doing the big walks in 2013, and then 2013, 2014, 2015, I was kind of taking more and more people on these walks, and I was kind of thinking, okay, well, we go on these walks, we have these amazing conversations, and then everything kind of dissipates. And so I, I proposed to Dan Rubin and Matt Mullenweg as well he came along the founder of wordpress he was he was with us and the three of us went on this eight day walk on the kumano kodo um in 2016 uh in basically in march and then dan and i hid away in a in a kind of a farmhouse for a week after that with a laser printer and just like put together koya bound the book wow. and that was interesting because i was trying to create an artifact from a walk and we were trying to do it in a time boxed way because we didn't want this to drag on forever and we ended up kickstarting it and leica ended up sponsoring it and we launched at the leica gallery here in ginza in tokyo and um it was just a lot of fun you know there's a lot of good energy around that book it sold out you know pretty quickly mm -hmm. it was it was that was that was you know the first real book to come directly from a walk and to be an artifact from the act of walking and craig mod will return soon for part two of his uh, his interview today he talks about his books and also those intriguing rules that he sets for himself when he's out on his walks his fabulous walks that he makes when it comes to uh to making portraits of uh, of those that he meets along his trail Right, news. News time. Da -dip, da -dip, da -dip. Well, first bit of news, it stopped raining. That's nice. Second bit of news, though, is a, <laughs> a horrible, menacing-looking, very grey cloud making its way this way. Third bit of news, the Scottish photo retreat is full. Um, yeah, we, uh, the last place went last week whilst I was on, on holiday. Uh, note to self, update the website showing that the Scottish retreat is full. And uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to it. I know it's months and months away yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it. Do you really want to look at the dog? Uh, <laughs> look at you. You look like a chamois leather, number one. Number two is trying to jump in the canal. Aren't you wet enough from all the rain, really? Um, though we still have um, a handful of places left now for the African retreat. We're off together for an adventure, a holiday, an expedition. Um, it's, it's a retreat as well. It's an all-in-one embracing adventure to the smiling coast of Africa. One of the, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to say this. It may so sound like I'm just making some sort of flippant um, statement, but I really do believe it's the friendliest country that I've visited certainly in africa we're going to the gambia we'll be spending time in january just into february next year uh, time with the people of this wonderful small country on the west coast of africa we'll be making river trips visiting markets and villages being at uh, one with the wildlife making documentary projects and experiencing the wonderful food of the uh, of the region it's a 10-day guided photo trip uh, with three guides. If you'd like more info, go to the link on the show page and also on the menu at photowalk.show. And I'm personally looking forward to uh, making a series of films and podcasts. Oh, look, the rain started to fall again while I'm out there. Come on, you said 25% chance. That's what my app said. I thought <laughs> 75. The other way, the positive way, looked good. Let's shelter under here for a second, pups. Just for a moment. Now, over the next few moments, you're going to hear from one of our guides, photojournalist Jason Florio, before his wife, 
writer and photographer, also Helen Jones Florio, sets this week's assignment. So it's a, it's a, fa it's a family affair, as they say. Firstly, though, here's Jason with a little more about the African retreat, which you can read more about, as I say, on the website, or at photowalkgambia.show, photowalkgambia.show. Here's, um, so here's Flo, as those who come walking with us in Africa will know him by come the end of our 10-day adventure, talking about, we're well, talking about the sounds of uh, this wonderful country and, uh, and the people that you're possibly going to meet. Jason, one of the things that, that I that I particularly, my senses are, are struck by whenever I go to a new place, a new country, uh, is the sound of a country. Um, and, and I think the Gambia definitely has that because it has this, this proliferation of, of bird life, which is amazing. And you've travelled the length uh, of the river, the River Gambia. Is that something that strikes you as well, that, that sound of a place? Yes, I think sound is its something we sort of tune in and out of, right? It's, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's sort of just like blurs in, into the background. But I think in Gambia, when you sort of decide to tune in, it's such a sort of a beautiful cacophony, you know, whether it's the, you know, the, the sounds of nature or I kind of love the urban sounds as well. I love all the, the sort of the chat that just kind of merges together into some sort of crazy Tower of Babel. I love the sound of the, you know, the kind of the, just people yelling at each other. I mean, in a, in a nice way. <laughs> the, the Gambians, especially the one, we have a, sort of a bit of a joke there that, you know, people can be within about two feet of each other, but they seem to be talking at huge volume. And, you know, one of our Gambians friends said, oh, yeah, they they still have their village voices. Ah. So meaning that so when you're in a village, you know, you'll be like one side of the village to the other and you'll be having a conversation across sort of 10 fence lines. But when people sort of move in into the into the urban areas they forget to sort of tune into <laughs> urban <laughs> urban <laughs> urban volume an excited chatter in other words yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that the the sound of the place is, is essential and you know if you could just incorporate that into a still picture would be would be wonderful i guess there's no reason why you can't tell, tell me about the um the tribes because there's a lot of tribes in uh, in the gambia they all get on harmoniously there are two, I think two of the larger ones is uh, Mandinka and Wolof. I, I think you speak a bit of one of them, don't you? Yeah, my Mandinka, after all these years, our Bubra taxi driver still breaks my, uh, <laughs> breaks certain parts of my body because he said you should be completely fluent by now. <laughs> um, but yeah, my Mandinka's, it's, it's okay. You know, I can sort of get myself into trouble with it, as they say. <laughs> Yeah, tribes, ethnic groups. Uh, I got told off one time for calling them tribes. Yeah, by I was, very, I, yeah, I was wincing very, as yeah. I said it because I wasn't sure whether that, that's the thing yeah, you, you can use. I, no, I think it's its one of those questions. I, I, I had the River Gambia expedition um, published in the New Yorker magazine, which is obviously sorry, my favourite magazine. You know, it's, it's very literary, but it's very contemporary as well, as, as well as publishing you know, some of the great, great writers. And someone had made a comment on one of the pictures and I'd mentioned the word tribes and they said oh it showed a certain lack of education to use the word tribe and I sort of was a bit stumped by that because in Gambia everyone refers to themselves which tribe they're from we don't they don't say I'm from this ethnic group or that ethnic group they use the word tribe so when I went back to Gambia I did you know kind of just double check with people so I think it's quite okay to use the word tribe because the Gambians themselves use it so I will I will go with what they prefer yeah the main tribes are men Dinka. And then on the coastal areas, you have Wolof, which are all along the Gambian coastline as well as the Senegalese coastline. It's it's always referred to as the language of traders. Yeah. And then you have various, you have the Fullers, which are historically kind of the nomadic pastoralists. Um, then you have other ethnic groups, say the Serres, which are very famous as being the, being the fishermen. And importantly, you have the, the Jolas, which are one of the kind of older ethnic groups in the in the area and you know, each one is very identifiable as uh, i say not not on the street you wouldn't know who is who as such but you know as far as sort of traditions and culturally you know each one has you know some very unique aspects to them which we can you know which can certainly delve into um on on the expedition i tell you what <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jason, first of all. But I tell you what, I'm looking forward so much to Africa 
I've just been caught in what I suppose is referred to commonly as stair rods rain. Rain what comes down sideways, if that makes any sense. Rain that, come on pups, this way. Don't fight with the, oh he's fighting with a branch that's come down. Um, did that come down in the rain? Well, let's rescue out here. Hold on. <laughs> Bear with me. There we go. Um, yeah, rain that, uh, oh, we, we're just both soaked through now. I mean, Barnes was looking like a chamois leather. Now I am. I'm looking forward to Africa for many reasons, one of those being the weather. Sam actually said to me, she was very envious, or she is rather very envious about this, this, uh, this trip. She says, I might just stow away in, uh, in some luggage. You'll find me when you get to the other end. I think she's... Um, She's particularly keen. Whenever I've been to the Gambia, I've been a few times now, I always talk about, well, it's the food. I love the food. Yeah, so I, I talk about the food and um, our trips to the, uh, to the Atlantic, um, some of the beautiful parts of that country that I visit. So uh, <laughs> he says as he's wandering along now, sopping, I, um, I'm very much looking forward to our trip. What's that in the background? I think the rain police are coming. I do. I think the rain police are coming, Sir Barkalot. Should I let that go by or shall I just carry on? Carry on, Neil. It's very authentic. Yeah, we're not so far away from the, uh, the A4 road, which uh, runs between Newbury, close to where I live, and Reading. There we go, it's gone. It's the photo walk, a show for hikers and walkers and photographers of whatever kind and experience, a show for those who find uh, escapism and peace, <laughs> with a capital P, um, away from the noise of this world, putting miles under our feet and making a picture or three to remind us of where those footprints were made. In my case, the, the photographs, I refer to them as my, my sketchbook images. Those some things and nothings, the pictures that say, I was there, you know, I saw that. I made a picture of that, I documented that. They don't have to be great big vistas, um, great big photographic statements. Um, some of my favourite pictures are, are very far from that, they really are. Right, the assignment, it's assignment time. I, uh, I suggested this was a bit of a family moment, this, because we had Jason Florio, the photojournalist who is um, the award-winning photojournalist, who's one of our guides. Very, very lucky to have Jason on this, uh, on this African trip. We really are. So we've had Jason a moment ago. Another weir. This is the walk of weirs today, isn't it? Come on, pups. Not going in that one either. So we've had Jason. Now here's Helen Jones Florio with, with a challenge that I've been waiting now to run uh, or record, actually, for a long, long, long time. Now, Helen's Instagram, uh, which I shall link to on the show page today, is um, Instagram.com, obviously, doors underscore Helen Jones Florio. I'll link to it. That'll be much, much easier. But she has this fascination of doors in the two places that uh, Helen and Jason have called home for a long, long time, Malta and the Gambia. Now, they are very colourful doors, fascinating places. They really are. And she's spent time photographing the doors in these two countries. And it's become, well, it's become its own Instagram grid. You can purchase prints from uh, the places that she photographs, which are fantastic. And, um, well, I'd go as far to say it's become somewhat of an obsession. And I'm sure she would agree with that. But, uh, but at this point, I'll say no more because uh, it's rather obvious that the challenge is going to be about making photographs of doors, yes. But there's a, there's a second part to it, this particular challenge. Roll tape, Neil, uh, and you won't do any more spoilers. The photo walk assignment. Helen, I've spoken many times about your doors project on this, this podcast. Um, we've spoken, I think, a little bit about it uh, between us as well on, on the show. I'm sure we have. But we've never set an assignment to do with doors. So there's a slight spoiler there from me that this is a, this is a project or, or an assignment for the next month about doors. But 
there's a twist. I think it might be a simple twist, um, <laughs> depending upon how uh, depending upon how how confident you are. But I'll let you take over from here. Okay. All right. Well, it is it is pretty pretty straightforward, and it's something I, I'm kind of I always think about when I'm photographing the doors of what's inside. So mine is is uh, is going to be a diptych. Whenever I photograph a door, I, I'm always interested in in what's behind it. So this is taking the first one will be from the outside, from the exterior, looking at the door or through the door frame, whichever you find. Use you know you can use the environment and take a, a horizontal or close up it's up to the photographer what they want to do what they choose it's their interpretation of this as well and the second is from the inside from the interior looking out through the door which is a good kind of practice for exposure as well especially if you're shooting in this and in, out into the sun but um it's, it's whether you know you could be right inside in the end of the hallway or you could be literally just using the door frame to look through and just what's outside and the idea comes really i think from initially from when i we were in malta and it's great that you, everybody you know you see all the kind of older folks sitting just inside their doors mm. and just watching the world go by so it's like doors are a two-way street you enter and you exit so what is what attracts you to that particular door and what gets your attention it could be a doorway to a house an apartment block a an shop, office block. i suppose a shop yeah uh, you know your your entrance to your work whatever something you're familiar with already yeah. your home a friends a relative or not familiar with at all such as a stranger's doorway and that sound might sound a bit well i'm not going to go knock on a stranger's door i mean there's a couple of times in malta i was actually invited into people's houses when i was photographing their doors and they just happened to be out there or coming out the door and they'd be like ah and they're so friendly so i mean yeah it could be someone you don't know or it could be a, a derelict building that you might be able to get into okay so the assignment is doors safety comes first if you are thinking of looking out of a stranger's door, as Helen does, with uh, within her amazing door projects made in Malta and the Gambia, and derelict buildings too, they pose their own issues. So safety first with all this. Although you are, of course, welcome to use places, doors that you know, your home, your friends, your business, places that you uh, you visit that have interesting stories. I'm, I'm thinking now of a place, a chapel on the side of a cliff that I visited in Wales recently. That had quite the view. So think doors from both sides. Shooting in, shooting out. The photo walk assignment. That's Helen Jones Florio. Um, with uh, this month's assignment, good luck. I need to give you a winner of last month's and I'm making the photo walk and I'm still deciding. So would you mind if I made that decision next week? Or perhaps announce it. I, I could also announce it on the show page, couldn't I? No, let me do it next week for you. That seems more appropriate, particularly because you've, you've sent me some fantastic... Well, you've sent me a problem. <laughs> because there are some fantastic images to go for last month's assignment, which was all about the beautiful game. And there were some terrific different, and I don't just mean um, angles in terms of geometry, I mean angles in terms of story and the way you thought about the pictures you made for that assignment. So I'll announce that next week. Otherwise, I'm going to make a rash decision. And... Uh, and that's not right. I should take time with at least, I don't know, three Garibaldis and a steaming hot cup of coffee. Remember earlier on we were talking, or I was talking about Druid's Temple, and I was fascinated about Druid's Temple. I, uh, I, t- <laughs> I took a moment to look a bit further into it. Now, I'd never heard of this Neolithic wonder. We've often talked about Stonehenge and the Avebury Stones. I mean, I photograph at the, the Avebury Stones when I'm making some of my photo walks. So we've talked about that before, but I'd not heard of this. I thought, where is this place, Druid's Temple? And I found this. And uh, far from the idea of, well, I don't want to s- spoil the idea of this place or sully it in, in some way, but it, it, it makes me actually more fascinated when I know the truth about it because I love the eccentricity of the great British folly those buildings those temples those towers those well all sorts of things that are constructed and made um, and have been put in the countryside you think what what is what is that and why is it here these follies that have been built and it seems that so well the druids temple is is that sort of thing near masham it's not in fact a real temple at all 
Um, it's, uh, I mean, it looks a, it's a, it's a tribute to Stonehenge in many respects, or, or the henges, the Avebury stones and so on. But it's a, no, it's a 19th century folly styled after stone circles and well-known prehistoric monuments such as Stonehenge. The Druids' temple was built to alleviate local unemployment, uh, allowing William Danby, a wealthy landowner of the time, to pay workers a shilling a day for their labour. What a lovely story. He thought, well, I've got all this money. I need to be distributing it or redistributing it. So I tell you what, let's build our own Stonehenge and we can pay people money. Uh, to do just that and uh, well that's that's the story of Druid's Temple it's on Craig's um, Instagram that I mentioned a little bit earlier on but I, uh, I'll leave uh, I'll tell you what I'll leave a link to it on the, the website as well right last letter of the day as the rains start to fall again the letters have gone a bit damp today <laughs> uh, they've pulped would be a fair description this one is from uh, Peter Foote now, to fill in the gaps, I'm near the road, by the way, so you can hear. What's that? We call it hair dryer. Those loud motorbikes, you know, not the, uh, not the thumping 1,000cc ones. No, the ones that sound like hair dryers. Me, 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 <laughs> um, Right, Peter Foote. To fill in the gaps, then, we were talking about heavy lifting. It's a comment. It's a... It's a it's not a, well, it's a sort of throwaway comment that I use quite a lot when I'm talking about sending in your letters to the show. I say, uh, if you can resize the pictures that you send into the email, which is stories at photowalk.show, if you can resize your full-sized images to two and a half thousand pixels, um, that makes it so much easier when it comes to, well, the, the download speeds for the, for the web page. Um, that's great if you can do it. And many of you have the appropriate software because you're photographers. But not everybody is that listens to this show. Some of you are walkers with an iPhone or maybe a camera. But you don't necessarily have the software um, whereby you can make the photographs 2,500 pixels. You can optimise those uh, pictures uh, for 2,500 pixels wide for the show page. So I always say at this point, don't worry if you can't. I'll do the heavy lifting for you. That to bear in mind as I read this. Good morning, Neil. In anticipation of colder months ahead, a couple of weeks ago I ordered a load of logs uh, for my wood-burning fire, which uh, would you... Uh, don't tell Greta, you'll be off her Christmas card list, uh, for my wood-burning fire, which were due to be delivered today. But I had a call from the company to say that due to the exceptional weather, very heavy rain, yes, we've talked about it, uh, would it be OK if they delivered tomorrow instead, which I, I was quite happy about. As usual, uh, I'd arranged for my son to come over and help me get them into the wood store. Uh, that involves him loading them into a barrow and then wheeling the barrow around, well, what is an assault course, to the back of the house, not as easy as it sounds, and then dumping them in front of me so I can load each individual log in, uh, well, let's say my particular way uh, into the store. Well, I was speaking to my partner just a moment ago, who's coming over in the morning, and warned her not to try and park her car in the drive. It's on a blind corner, you see, as there'll be uh, a pile of logs in the way. She asked, unsurprisingly, is Jake going to be able to help you load them up? I'm not as strong as I used to be. I'm not sure if I'm going to be any use to you. I immediately replied, <laughs> without conscious thought, don't worry, I'll do the heavy lifting. As soon as I said it, I realised whose fault it was. Yours, Neil. In return for indoctrinating me over recent months, probably years, if you ever do decide to replace flasks with T-shirts that say, I'll do the heavy lifting, can I lay my claim to have the first one, please? Regards from Peter. Peter, yes, you can. Yes is the answer. Affirmative, yes. If the heavy lifting one ever becomes a T-shirt, I'm not quite sure it would catch on. People would be thinking, well, why have you got, I'll do the heavy lifting? written on your t-shirt what's that mean what's that all about i don't know perhaps it would but peter you're first on the list that's my personal promise to you so part two now of my conversation with uh, with craig mod my guest is a writer he's a photographer he's a bookmaker he is i think a true inspirer 
Let's get back on the trail in Japan with him now for, uh, for part two of our conversation with Craig Mott. Let's start this second part of our conversation by talking about the walks you make across Japan with your, well, I'm going to call it your notepad and camera. You, you made some rules for, for the big walk, didn't you? No media, no social networks. Mm -hmm. Not sure I could apply myself to rule three, which is no podcast. We'll have to maybe skip over that one because <laughs> I essentially produce a podcast that says, listen to us while you walk. So I might, I might, I might have to gently disagree with you on, on that particular <laughs> one, but I see where you're going. I, I love this final rule, a shoot somebody's portrait before 10 a.m. Yeah. Why, why before 10, by the way? And, and d d were you always able to do it? I mean, it, it, was it a hard and fast rule that you got past 10? I said, I'm so sorry, you're a really interesting person, but I can't be shooting your portrait now. It's after 10. So all those rules are about being present, right? Yeah. So it's just about not teleporting out of the moment. And, um, you know, and the portrait rule is really kind of the, the kind of apotheosis of being in the moment because you have to, you have to, you have to make that terrifying leap of, you know, approaching someone and potentially being rejected. And like, you know, it's just like, it's what everyone's kind of crippled by when, when uh, you go out and you try to do street photography, or you try to really kind of like connect with folks. And so I, the 10am sort of line was arbitrary. But the point was just to do it early in the day. Because what I found is that as soon as you did one, the joy of approaching someone talking with them, taking their portrait, you know, really feeling like you connected with them was so it was such a high. Yeah. And it just made the day feel so full. And to have that by 10 or 11 a.m. already, it just feels like you've won, you've, you've completely won the day. And I also just found it begat more doing that. So the quicker I could break the ice for myself, I was like, okay, I've got to find someone. And it's just kind of funny because you don't know where you're going to be at 9 30 or 9 45 in the morning and so a lot of times it'd be a farmer in a field and i'd kind of like run out <laughs> again like you know why am i sticking to these rules i don't know this is how we work you know i find that i i need deadlines i need weird rules yeah. and i'm able to kind of play the game of okay let's let's get it before 10 how can we do it and so it just makes you do strange things that you wouldn't do otherwise so running into a field to get to get the farmer's portrait <laughs> going into a, a tatami maker shop because it's 9 50 you're like ah i've just got to go in anywhere okay here's a shop let me go in hey guys uh, i'm walking to kyoto can i please take your, your portraits every day i'm taking a portrait of someone and you find that people generally are really open to it and mm. kind of delighted and you kind of leave both you and the person that you've interacted with feel elevated and feel like better people and richer people. And it's like just a wonderful experience across the board. So to kind of set that rule on the ground and be like, all right, by 10 a.m., feel this kind of goodness, like, uh, you know, it becomes addictive. What sort of people did you meet that, that particularly left an impression? A lot of the small business owners. I mean, I think because of where I came from, where I did not see people thriving, yeah. where I did not see small businesses thriving, where I saw a lot of struggle, I didn't see a lot of abundance. And so to be in the countryside in the middle of nowhere and kind of go into some of these small shops that have been you know some of them run for 10 years some 40 some 80 several mm -hmm. generations to go in there and just kind of bear witness to someone who is enjoying their life who's committed to a simple craft or whatever it is who's living kind of a rich place in the community you know in, in their own in their own really simple way they're they're kind of a pillar a part of a part of that local community i find that that to me is really heartening. That is really inspiring. And it's, it's again, it's filling this gap that I just didn't have as a kid. I didn't bear witness to anything like this. And so to see it over and over and over again and to talk to these people, um, it just fills me with a kind of really nice hope. And it all starts with a hello, doesn't it? I mean, as, as you rightly said, yeah. sometimes we, we fear that, uh, oh my, well, well, I'm, I'm going to get turned down. They won't want to talk to me. Yeah. They'll probably think I'm a weirdo. I'm running across a field to see a farmer. But it's not like that, is it? You're really surprised by by human nature when, when you make that step. Well, especially if you're doing something unique, yeah. right? And so, like, it's easy when, when you're walking, like, from Tokyo to Kyoto, or after, like, basically four or five days from outside of Tokyo, it's you're just doing an interesting thing. Yeah. Like, you are going to be the most interesting person they meet by far, uh, maybe in their lives <laughs> to a certain weird extent. So, you know, to say, I've, look, I'm walking from Tokyo to Kyoto, I'm two weeks into it, that blows the minds of everyone yeah. you talk to. And to be doing it kind of in the historical context, I mean, the roads I walk are historical roads that have historical significance. And so to, be, to do it in that context, I think also makes people feel excited because you're engaging 
sort of deliberately with the history of their land. Yeah. And a lot of times I'll be walking on the old road talking to the people who live on it. And so that's, that is kind of a, a, an added bonus of being one of the very few people, yeah. you know, I'd say less than a dozen people a year walk these roads fully being one of those people actually doing it. You know, that, that's a, that's a huge catalyst for, yeah. having great conversations and having people become vulnerable and open up to you. I watched the video, The Craft of Kisa by Kisa. Phenomenal work. Quite quite the process. Thanks. I mean, it's a book about walking. It's not, actually, if I say it's a book about walking in Japanese cafes, that doesn't do any justice at all. Because it's, it's so much more than that. These are amazing places that you find. I mean, maybe I look through rose-tinted spectacles into this sort of, uh, this very romantic notion of Japanese culture and life, but it is just how fascinating these places are. I'm not going to do it justice. You'll you'll have to explain what these these places are. Kisa by Kisa was about walking from Tokyo to Kyoto and basically eating pizza toast yeah. almost every day yeah, along yeah, the way. Yeah, pizza toast. Um, and and it was, that was that wasn't the intent. That wasn't. I didn't leave Tokyo with that uh, explicit goal. Yeah. But uh, the more I walked and in, in going into the countryside of Japan, seeing depopulation. Uh, you hear about depopulation a lot, but seeing it firsthand, going down the high streets and seeing all the shuttered shops, mm. um, seeing essentially no children, kind of bearing witness to that firsthand, and then realizing that the only shops that were sort of left were basically barber shops and these kisaten, so these old Japanese style mid century cafes. The equivalent would be essentially like diners in America, like mm. American diners. And these um, don't look anything like diners. And, <laughs> They don't. Yeah, no, they, they, they're more like living rooms. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I start, I, I began to notice that these places were one of the few things that stuck around as a community kind of hub. Yeah. And by going into them in the, in the middle of the, the countryside, far away from big cities, it was the easiest way to quickly get a sense of the town that you were in. And you, you could talk to three or four regulars and, you know, they were mostly in their seventies and eighties. And, you know, it was just real, they were, they were kind of wonderful pseudo retirement home slash, you know, old person care homes, um, where, you know, every morning they'd have the regulars come in. They, they usually have coffee tickets, 11 tickets for the price of 10. Each coffee ticket gets you a black coffee, a hard boiled egg and a piece of toast. Right. And I would say, I think like a packet of 11 probably cost at most $25, right. something like that. So it's like you're paying like 250 you know, two bucks, two fifty for your little breakfast thing. You come in with your newspaper and you, you know, you can catch up with, with folks and maybe you live alone, maybe you're widowed, yada, 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 all these things. So the, the more and more I kind of connected with this culture, just the, the more I realized how rich it was and how it was worth bearing witness to. As a writer, actually, this book, Kisa by Kisa, this, this glimpse into a world and way of living that most of us will never get to see firsthand, sadly. This is, this is though, more, more, more than simply a book that looks outwards at the world because it's inward looking too. Tell, tell me about that part of the, the process or the book, if you will. I think Kisa by Kisa was my first foray into being a little bit vulnerable and a little bit of kind of putting myself on the page in a yes, way that yes. I don't think I had done before. Yeah. And so I think people do get it just thinking, oh, it's going to be like, look at this weird cafe, look at this pizza toast, look at this, you know, but it's more about my history a little bit, you know, and it's more about these kind of weird connections with these, with the people more than fetishizing the cafe or fetishizing, you know, the look of these places, which is what most books about these cafes do. It's pure fetishization of a certain aesthetic. Yeah. And for me, the aesthetic is completely secondary to the stories of the people and the sense of kind of connection that I found um, engaging with all these folks. You make this, these wondrous short, short films, five minutes of a, what, I, what I would probably term as a shared experience, actually, such, a, such as pizza, toast and coffee. And I don't know why I didn't expect um, Kisa Ten to, to, to be a sort of a, a mecca for pizza toast, but that's another conversation altogether. But uh, you, you gently introduce this this culture. Um, I, you hear the, the gentle rain in the background outside as you're going into into this cafe, which is a th- becomes a theme of this piece. Talk me through your creative thoughts when you approach these films that you make. None of your films shout at me. Um, mm. I wouldn't expect them to because I don't believe that would be a Craig Mod film if they did. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a product of I think the, the work that I, I am drawn to and the work I love. I mean, when I think about documentary stuff, you know, it's like 
early Errol Morris, you know, uh, Gates of Heaven and uh, Vern in Florida, you know, these, these very quiet films where it's just, Hey, we're going to put the camera down in front of an interesting human and just let them go, yeah. you know, let them talk. Yeah. Um, or Warner Herzog's earlier stuff, you know, he likes to inject himself more into the narrative, but like, you know, the, the, a lot of these are quiet filmmakers. And for me, the film stuff, again, was about supporting the book. So the documentary on making the book um, and then the pizza, toast and coffee was actually a promise I made to sort of backers of uh, people who bought the first edition of Kisa by Kisa, where I said, if I, if we sold out of that first edition in the first like week or whatever, then I said I'd make a documentary, not thinking that we would sell out. And of course, it sold out in like three days. So I was on the hook for this documentary and I, you know, was during covid Obviously, I got into the film stuff. You know, I've got my Sony here. I've got, you know, the nice mics. I, you know, yeah, like a lot of us, I think we went kind of crazy on AV stuff because we couldn't leave our home. And so I found that I had all this equipment where I could go. And there was a cafe down the road who, in my opinion, was making the most interesting pizza toast that I found in all of my walks. And I kind of went to him and I said, hey, can I come in here early in the morning and just set up and film you for a little bit, you know, doing this? And he was so embarrassed by it. He couldn't understand why I would want to do this. Yeah. But he acquiesced and, you know, in the, deep in the middle of COVID, I went, my assistant came and we kind of shot this guy tried to get as much good footage as I could get. I didn't show him the final movie uh, until about a year later. I just I, I didn't find myself back in his in his shop. And yeah. about a year later after it came out and it had, I don't know, like whatever, how many, ever, many views it has on YouTube, 20,000, 30,000, whatever it is. And um, in all the comments, and I said, oh, hey, by the way, yeah, I finished that video, you know, that documentary of you. And he said, he said, oh, I thought, it, you know, I thought you couldn't use the what? footage. Blah, blah, blah. He's kind of like, really, yeah. he's really really kind of talking down on himself. I said, no, 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 here, check it out. And I played it. I played it for him and he started crying ah. and he was so moved. And I was reading him the, the all the comments and I, you could just tell that uh, it was a really important moment in his life. This kind of reflection on what he had been doing for the last 30, 40 years, yeah. kind of without self-awareness and seeing that, oh, there was a beauty to it. There was a poetry to it. And that I saw it, but not only me, but look, 30,000 other people yeah. recognize it and are kind of in love with it. So thank you. It's a sim- and it was a sim- super yeah. powerful. Things Become Other Things. This is your latest work. Walking, talking with farmers, Kisa owners, drunken fishermen. I'm, I hope I get this right. Okonomiyaki ladies. Yeah. Foul-mouthed little kids and whispering priests. I mean, what's not to love about a list like that? <laughs> it was, it's a ragtag, <laughs> it bizarre group of folks. It is. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, so this is my next book. Uh, this is the one that sold to Random House. Um, and the deal is that I'm allowed to put out my fine art edition, um, and that's coming out hopefully this year. And so my edition will be the essays and photographs like Kisa by Kisa, yeah. but about this peninsula in uh, central Japan, the key peninsula. So Mie and Wakayama prefectures. And I've walked, you know, I've walked some two, 3,000 kilometers down there. And the book itself is about one of the walks that's that's about probably five or 600 kilometers I did uh, a couple of years ago. And it's that's kind of the pivot. So it's the, the, the book is about that walk, but I'm th- reflecting back on all the other walks I've done on the peninsula. And I'm also reflecting back on a childhood friendship. So my best friend in elementary school, uh, we're in the town I grew up in, and reflecting on basically our childhood, what we struggled with, mm. Um, as I do this walk. So as I'm walking, I'm seeing little kids, I'm seeing basically this peninsula that is economically quite depressed. And these towns are kind of disappearing. But everything is kind of happening with a certain grace that is surprising. Yeah. So even though these towns are disappearing, the jobs are, are disappearing, they're not falling into like fentanyl pits. They're not pe- becoming addicted to opioids. The um, violence isn't rising. You know, people are kind of having these graceful kind of completions. Like these towns are disappearing. There's nothing you can really do about it, but they're disappearing in a way that to me feels hopeful um, and feels kind of inevitable. When you take away all these jobs, like there's no way to kind of revitalize these places. They're, they're sort of done. But they're finishing in a way that is hopeful in the same way that like my hometown in a lot of similar ways was kind of falling apart, you know, industrial jobs, moving south, going to China, leaving America, that kind of standard blue collar work kind of disappearing from the American fabric of, of, you know, 
sort of middle class society and it not being replaced by anything good, but instead heroin, fentanyl, mm. gang violence, uh, robberies, mm. you know, uh, the lack of funding, you know, schools kind of you know, for, you know, falling for further and further down uh, in terms of resources that they have to, to offer to the students. And so the book is really this kind of indictment of a lot of what is happening in America right now mm. through the lens of this friendship. Yeah. Um, you know, in first grade, my my friend and I stood shoulder by shoulder to shoulder, and by the time we graduated high school, we were in very different places because of the way that the system kind of cleaved us apart, and and whether or not you tested well, and there was something tr- you know tragic and traumatic about that kind of separation and that cleaving, and so the book is kind of. It's just it's it's looking back to honor the friendship, but it's also looking back to say you know things don't have to be this way, and I'm walking through a prime example of how it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And as I talked to the whispering priests and the Okonomiyaki ladies and the, the drunken fishermen and the, the, the horse betters and things like that, I'm being inspired by and mutually, I hope we're mutually elevating each other and we're having these, you know, incredible fundamental human experiences of, of kind of connecting with each other. And as I'm experiencing all of that, I'm kind of reflecting back on what went wrong, essentially in terms of support, and um, economic dist- you know, distribution of wealth in, in the States and how that reflected in this friendship I had as a, as a kid. The loss of your friend. How, how do you broach that particular subject in the book? Yeah, so I, this is one of the things I'm trying to work out about how to talk about this book because um, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, my, my friend was murdered. Right. So the, the, this is sort of what comes out in the book and it sort of builds up to that. It's kind of this reflection. But yes, I mean, in the end, he, we, we both graduated high school and a few weeks after we were done, I was kind of on my way out of, out of that town. I was really lucky. I, you know, like I said, I tested well. I um, was able to use my computer skills to kind of find a way beyond the town in a way a lot of kids weren't. He wasn't. He was stuck there and he was murdered. He was murdered. There's a, something happened. And the kind of book is, is really in part two a reflection on the guilt that you kind of carry escaping a place like that. You know, and a lot of the I realize a lot of the walking that I do, especially the solo walking and the kind of going for a month or, you know, six weeks or whatever of solo walking, a lot of that is is in a way, penance for having survived and gotten out of there and wow. feeling guilt about, wow. you know, this friend having not made it. And in a lot of ways, I feel uh, a duty to bear witness to the world, you know, in his steed. I mean, you know, and, and recognizing, again, like being able to connect with these these people along the way, taking their portraits, photographing them. Yeah. Uh, it really does feel like I'm an avatar for experiencing what this, this friend of mine never got to experience. And it kind of, it really becomes a, a much more spiritual kind of, really powerful powerful thing and and so for me a lot of the walking is connected with 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 this penance with this kind of um reflection this particular walk was this mainly alone i I know many of your walks do involve yeah quite a lot of sometimes a lot of people yeah i mean i try to do solo walks for the most part just because i find i can't photograph if anyone's with me and your, your interactions with people are completely different if you have even one other person with you so being alone is really critical to having you know Werner Herzog calls ecstatic yeah. truths you know ecstatic life experiences and I find for me I really need to be solo um, and kind of out there you know vulnerable in that in that in that aloneness to really connect with folks in, in kind of an interesting way but I do you know I do run these other walks with groups um, Kevin Kelly and I run these walk and talks all over the world yeah. and uh, those are great but they're completely separate I wouldn't even categorize them as being remotely the same act we in both of them we happen to be walking but like to walk alone for weeks and weeks at a time and set these rules and to be hyper present and to sort of connect with community and people and photograph and write portraits and photograph portraits that is its own beautiful ascetic experience and when you walk with 10 brilliant people you know like what happens with kevin kelly and in the groups we put together like it's just completely different. You're just in your. It's the group. You're connecting with the group. You're kind of um, talking about all these different ideas. You're almost the walk is almost secondary or tertiary to everything else that's happening. But bringing it back round to the writing for the last couple of moments, there there are a hundred barriers in our minds to to writing. You do it with a vigor. I wonder what puts people off most. Do you think it's oh, who's going to read this? Am I good enough? Is it Shakespeare? <laughs> I mean, I think it's. I think it's very. It's similar. It's very connected to the portrait before ten a.m. thing. 
you know, it's just, you just have to get over that activation energy. You just have to do it. Um, I find for me, you know, it's like most mornings I'm not jumping out of bed, running to the keyboard. Let me write, let me write, let me write. You know, I, I have to turn off the internet. I have to use software to block the internet. And I try to start the days with reading a book that inspires me, that activates wow. the mind, you know. And when I'm reading prose that to me feels somehow truthful, you know, uh, Louis Gluck just passed away, the poet, like her work, um, you know, Annie Dillard's work, Dennis Johnson, there's a, there's a whole host of writers, Michael Andange, uh, Lynn Tillman, who's, I try to start the days with picking up their work. And if I read three or four or five pages of their, their work, I will be unable to suppress my desire to write. It'll ju- I just have to go and do it. And so, you know, for, for me, it's about creating these systems and these rules and these barriers to, to procrastination that allow me to, to, to get the writing going. And then what I found is that the pop-up newsletters are the ultimate forcing function to get me to write as yeah. much as possible. And so when I run a pop-up newsletter, which could be anywhere from, some of them have been a month long or, you know, 35 days long, which is insane to me now looking back on it. But for the sweet spot to me is like a mu- is like basically a week to two weeks. And I'm going to run another one actually in November. I'm doing another Tokyo walk. I'm going to walk from one edge of the prefecture to the other. So I'm going to start in Disneyland. I'm going to finish in the highest, on the highest mountain on the edge of the prefecture in, in Western oh, Tokyo. Amazing. And that'll be six days. And every day I will photograph the heck out of things. I will take a bunch of notes and then in the evening when I get to the hotel for the day, I will spend four or five hours editing the photos and writing that day's essay and publishing it. And so by having that audience and by making this promise to them, and again, no one's paying any money for this directly. You know, you might get members that want to support, you know, like the project and so they become a member, but no one's paying directly. So it's really just this set of rules that I feel bound to on my own. It's just kind of a game I play with myself. And um, by the end of a week or two, I'll often have several dozen photos that I am totally excited about that are, are a beautiful foundation of photos that could be part of a book, plus thirty to 40,000 words that I've written, mm. which is just in- incredible. So this will be my third Tokyo walk I'm doing in November. If I write like I've written before, I'll have 30, so let's say 35,000 words, which means I'll, of the three Tokyo walks, I'll have essentially 100,000 words about Tokyo, about the city. I'll have several thousand photos. Of those, maybe 100 will be two-star photos, and 20 of them will be five-star photos, right? And so there's the book. So you take those 100,000 words, whittle it down to 30,000, build out from those 30,000 a little bit more. Take those 20, 30 photos that I've shot over the course of, you know, three weeks of walking Tokyo, and then that's it. That's the book. So that'll be one of the, that's like a book project for next year, for example. But it's really about setting up the structures of something like a pop-up newsletter connected with a walk, connected with that daily ascetic practice of like getting the words down, writing every night, two, three, four thousand words. Um, if I if I seem productive, it's only because I've I, I kind of hack sort of productivity into my life by making promises in public, and I find that really works well for me. Uh, but maybe there's also a catharsis sometimes uh, involved in being able to write because you do write um, much shorter, humorous accounts of your life. I mean, you've just taken up drumming again. I will never, by the way, turn up at an airport only two hours early. After I read <laughs> after I read that I, I, I feel I shall be the Dalai Lama drifting through Heathrow Airport from yes. now on four hours yes. early. That is the <laughs> uh, that is my mission. My, well, my, one of my missions within that um, uh, approach will be to get, finally, for the first time in my life, uh, I feel I may have found a hack through that particular essay of yours to get an upgrade. Yes, <laughs> just be really nice and go early. <laughs> right, uh, we have a question at the end uh, of, of many of my interviews, which in a wonderful roundabout or, or, or cyclical approach to this particular interview, I want to make into a book. And it's called The Book of Why. But mm. Because I'm fascinated by photographers and creatives and writers uh, and, and their why. And it's such an open question. It can mean all sorts of things to all sorts of people so i'm i'm going to ask you inevitably what your why is honestly just a richness of of living and respect for having this opportunity like i said to bear witness you know and i think the being adopted you really do feel like there's a tenuousness to your existing you know i mean not ever obviously not everyone comes from like a 
a, a mother and father who are like, let's make a child and let's really plan it and structure it and da da da. But when you're adopted, I mean, you really did kind of accidentally come out and there's a chance that you could have been aborted and that didn't happen for whatever reasons and then you get handed off and so I've kind of lived you live with this kind of sense of tenuousness and kind of how every day that you have is sort of it's like a bonus day and so really like all of the work that I'm doing is just about bearing witness about trying to understand what a richness of life feels like and looks like um, trying not to be distracted by glittery things and, and counting how much is you know in, in your bank account being focused on sustainability and helping essentially as I do this work that to me feels important it makes me feel rich and full and excited and, and grateful to be here on this earth and uh, photography is, is a tool to kind of deepen that connection writing is a tool to deepen that connection books are kind of the apotheosis of taking all those things and putting them together in a way that multiplies the experience in a way that's durable and long lasting. I'm just grateful for all of that. And that's kind of what it boils down to. And, and it's just fun. So, you know, how do you, how do you keep having fun and bear sustainable witness to, to life and elevating, figuring out how to elevate the folks that you encounter on the way? Squelch, squelch, squelch. And the rain keeps falling. My thanks to Craig Mod for his time uh, recording our conversation uh, this week. I very much appreciate your time, Craig. I'm so looking forward to, uh, to the book that I've ordered. I've ordered Kisa Kisa because I'm fascinated by that. I dare say it'll be the first of a few of Craig's, including the new one. Um, I will link to Craig, of course, on the show page today, and there'll be some pictures that uh, accompany that as well, so you can see some of his work. Although you'll see it, of course, on his portfolio if you link through. Now, usually, I have all the details as to what is on the Extra Mile this week, but in that I haven't made that particular walk yet, the Extra Mile one, that is, for our patrons, it's, uh, it's going to be a bit... <laughs> A bit of a surprise. I may dip back into the archive from a long, long, long time ago and pull out a a couple of parts and that uh, to sit alongside some commentary. I don't know. I'm not quite sure yet. So uh, I tell you what, I'll press play on the playout song instead and come back with a PS in a moment. The postscript, the final thoughts from somebody who started the letters rolling today. Everything seems today to be a beautiful circle. I started out walking in the industrial part. I'm ending up, as you can hear now, closer and closer. I come back to the road uh, once more. And if you're new to this show, because uh, you may well be, we have uh, new walkers with us every single week. The playout song really is just a song. It's very unusual for a a photography podcast, I know. It's a song that uh, we make some final frames to. A song that we can, well, where we can think about what's been said today. And today, oh, I love this. This is Patrick Lemieux and Ziv Moran. And there's a little bit of a feel to the song that encapsulates a few things today. Even though I may be, another one of my favourite phrases, shoehorning a few a few thoughts in here but there's a, an idea I think a feeling within the, the the song that's to come this idea of carefree walking and uh, and some references or two actually to photography so this is a song called Back Home Again and I shall return in a moment with today's wonderful postscript it's in the air the feel that it's bringing back images
of light Even when it comes, I'll be fading in time Back home again, perfect play out song for today. Well, you can hear the rain, can't you? Listen, oh. <laughs> I've given up, tried to stay. I didn't come out with a, um, a raincoat today, Neil. Well, I didn't think I needed it in my app. I trusted I shall not be doing that again. My only hope is that you fall. Oh, Barn, I'm so sorry, look at you. Yeah, right on cue, shake, shake yourself. Shall I do the same? It doesn't look quite right when I do it, does it? We're sheltering, we're hunkered down in uh, some woodland here. And he's looking at me, So Barkalot is thinking, what are we doing? And uh, we have at least 10 minutes to, to go on this walk before we can find somewhere dry to be. Oh, I'll make a final sketchbook image though. I think this one should definitely be about the rain in some way. I'm gonna take a picture of the rain on the leaves, beautifully lush, having said that. There we go. Let me take just one more of those. Oh, for some reason, why has that happened? I know it's a bit darker, but uh, the shutter speed should not have gone that low. Here we go. One two fifth, F2.8. Glossy leaves. Oh, I've got rain in my eyes. It's all going on. That's it for this week's show, he says, as he untangles Barnes' lead from a, another branch. I think we've earned a coffee and some Garibaldi's, certainly. Should we make a run for it, pups? Or should we just hunker down here for a few more moments? Just a few closing thoughts before the PS. My sincere thanks to you if you are or you're about to become an extra mile. And my promise to you is that um, I'll continue to keep building a community of kindness a safe place to share our thoughts about this thing we love, photographing, walking, hiking and sharing. Uh, my thanks to Neil Ford, who looks after the IT, Andrea Gilpin, who's across Instagram, and Kelly Mitchell with Emily Renier, who look after our Facebook members. The new newsletter then will either be up right now or it may be a little later on uh, during today, Friday 3rd of November. It'll feature the picture and the story that I'm about to share. Um, so it'll be on the show page as well. And in the newsletter, uh, well, I'm hoping that you can forward the newsletter on to friends of yours. You'll be able to find it on the, on the website today and subscribe, yes. And then I'm hoping you may forward it on to uh, other photography friends of yours because it's not just going to be a, a newsletter full of things that are being sold, no. There'll be an opportunity to come on the retreats, yes, but it'll be thoughts and ideas, sharings, um, the way that I like a, uh, a newsletter to be. Now, if a picture could be a PS, it would be this one. It's the postscript time of the show, but I'm delighted to include words too from a, a very famous philosopher. The letter first, because we're closing unusually with an actual letter. I did say Miles Barfield would uh, bookend the show, and he is, with a beautiful picture called Heaven's Glow. Now, this is a picture that's made looking up into the air, and um, I've said his name many times, and I'll unashamedly continue to do so my mentor the late Steve Shipman who was um, a fashion photographer an editorial photographer a very fine wedding photographer a portrait photographer and um, he uh, he gave a bit of advice that said start your story by looking up 
look up. Look what the way. <laughs> if I look up, I'll get some r- more rain in my eye. But you know what I mean. That's a way to, to tell a story of a day, a moment in time. And it's one that I carry with me. Um, so Heaven's Glow is a picture of the, the wonderful skies from miles to accompany the most beautiful picture of these clouds with the following thoughts. There is little worse, Neil, than waking to an unjustified cloud of melancholy. Sometimes it's vital to take a moment to refocus, a practice I often find necessary. As the sun began to break through these heavy skies, says Miles, I thought of you and the other extra milers and photo walkers. I offered a quick prayer too, expressing gratitude for having you as part of my weekly life, even if only through my ears. While listening to the birds, I reflected on something Marcus Aurelius wrote, and I thought I'd share it with you. When you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, and to love. Come on, Barnes. Let's make a break for it. Oh, we're both so wet, I know. Come on. Come on, Rain, give us a break. Stop now. Come on, Barnes. Let's go. (laughs) You know, you get to that time, Barney, when you're so wet, you don't really notice the rain anymore. It just, it doesn't seem to make a difference. The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.